Into the fire of spring, our calendar and cares we fling, and to a distant beach take wing for marlin, sailfish, and raise that sting. The kingdom of the sea. Your guide is Colonel John D. Craig, author, explorer, and adventurer. A familiar figure on beaches the world over. Your host and fellow adventurer, Bob Stevenson. I'll bet that started a lot of fish stories. It's a real champion. Must have given that fisherman the scrap of his life. As you might guess from this, our adventure takes to the home of the marlin and the sailfish on a sea vacation to a happy playground south of our border. And here to tell you more is our man of the sea, Colonel John D. Craig. I get a strange feeling inside me, Bob, when I see a trophy like this. Like what? Well, it may look nice up there, but I would much rather see it fighting mad, leaping and twisting and slashing its way through the blue, blue waters of its homeland. These magnificent fighters belong in the sea, and that's where we're going to see them shortly. Now, just south of La Paz in Baja, California, facing the deep blue sea of Cortez, is a delightful, historic, romantic spot named Las Cruces. And this is the location of our playground by the sea, and the best marlin and sail fishing grounds I have ever found. We are flying over the Gulf of California, looking down on the same strange terrain that the early Padres explored over two centuries ago. In the cockpit is Rod Rodriguez, our host and owner of Las Cruces Hacienda, son of a former president of Mexico. As we approached it, we could see why it was called Las Cruces, three crosses. This is an historical spot, and we're going to visit it later. Is a boat or a private plane the only way of getting there, Colonel? No, you can make it to Las Cruces by commercial airline. Las Cruces Hacienda nestles there in a beautiful grove of palm and fruit trees. It was originally built by the Pearling King of La Paz over a century ago. The fruit trees, mangoes, guavas, bananas, oranges, practically every tropical fruit you can name, were presents from ship captains who stopped here to trade for pearls. That's the airstrip, right at the end of the little bay of Las Cruces. Airstrip is right. Was that the only canyon they could put it in? Yes, the rod has made this landing so often there's nothing to worry about, except the sea at one end and the mountains at the other. Mm-hmm. Las Cruces Hacienda is one of the most charming spots I know of in Baja, California. It's right on the coast within 50 feet of the Blue Sea, coconut palms and a little swimming pool there in the forecourt of the Hacienda and the shining sea beyond. But Zale and Perry were anxious to try the water. They could hardly wait. Here off the shore of Las Cruces is one of the finest marlin and sword fishing grounds in the world. They catch them here in abundance, and I've seen that rack hung with a couple of ton of marlin and sailfish, one day's catch. Well, I've seen all sorts of fishing, but with a wheelbarrow? <laughs> Bob, he's wheeling home a king-size fish dinner. When the fish boats come in, they hang the fish here so that the Nimrod can be photographed with his catch. That's almost as important as catching it, isn't it? That's right. The pictures prove it. But everyone in the party was anxious to get into the water. It's very warm, it's blue, it's crystal clear. Does he always swim with a spear gun? That's just in case. He's going undersea to take a good look. That Labrador Retriever is one of the few diving dogs in the country. He'll dive down six feet to recover things from the bottom when he wants to. I see they're using masks and swim fins. That's all they need right now.
Are they swimming in the ocean on the Pacific side or in the Gulf? This is the Gulf, Bob. Las Cruces is around the point up into the Gulf of California. The Mexicans prefer to call it the Sea of Cortez. Around these grottos and caverns, there were large schools of fish. Some of them were very beautiful. Those with the little marks near their tail are surgeon fish. And those marks are bone-like scales. They're very sharp. They use them as weapons. Eagle rays swim through the water like birds flying through the air. This one is a leopard ray. He's spotted. They move quickly when disturbed. Many rays rest on the white sandy bottom. Sometimes they cover themselves with sand. Perry had fun trying to catch them by the tail. Sometimes they're called the rattlesnakes of the sea because they have a stinger right at the root of the tail. If you step on them, you're likely to get hit with that stinger. Well, don't tell me, tell it to him. Most of these rays are known as trash fish to the sportsman. Just a lot of bother on a hook and line. We decided we'd do a little spear fishing. In that warm water, you can stay beneath the surface a long time, much longer than if the water is really cold. When the water is cold, do you use up more air, is that it? No, it rather constricts your breathing. We saw several large rays down here. Zale thought her safety was off, but it wasn't. He had to go back for another breath of air. She spotted this big ray sleeping on the bottom. He's really a big one. What he, kind is he? He's a stingray. He's partly covered with sand. And so large, Zale wasn't sure she should tackle him. She fired and hit him right dead center. I think the ray was stunned at first. He didn't react for a moment. Well, he's reacting now. Look at that sand. <laughs> could do to haul it out. How big would you say he is, Colonel? He measured four feet across, Bob, and he weighed a little over 110 pounds. Golly, that's more than Zale weighs. These are the famous manta rays, baby mantas. They swim with graceful, bird-like motions. Now, that's a different ray from the one that Zale speared, isn't it? Oh, yes. This is not a stingray. This is a manta. One of the boys speared one, brought it up. Mexicans eat them. They consider the fins a delicacy. They taste something like sole. The meat is very white. He's a pretty big fellow, isn't he? No, he's just a baby. Actually, when they're full grown, they will measure 25 feet across. She thought maybe this one would recover, so she turned it loose. You know, Zale's a girl after my own heart. Was there any word from the little Ray? Oh, we went down for a look-see, and sure enough, we saw him slowly swimming away to join his buddies. The area provides many types of fishing. Special boats are required for marlin fishing, but outboards are fun for exploring and trolling. I was engineer on this occasion. We were using very light tackle, a little bass rod and a small size reel. Dale hooked onto something that made her think she must have snagged a whale it pulled so hard. But when she got it alongside, it turned out to be a needlefish, very long and skinny. Are they good to eat? Oh, they're sometimes cooked and eaten. They have an excellent charcoal flavor. Yeah. 
We didn't want to keep it, so we threw it back. Get along, little fishy. Yes, but they didn't throw this one back. This is a Tamara, a golden bass. They're highly prized by our boatmen as food. We also caught several of these jacks. They have delicate flesh, very good eating. They belong to the Pompano family. Hours later, we returned after a wonderful day's fishing. Now, if you don't care to skin dive or fish, you can just sit around the swimming pool and relax. The warm sun, the sea breezes provide Baja California with one of the finest climates in North America. Watching the youngsters around the pool is amusing. These are Bud Parr's and Rod Rodriguez's children. He can just about make it with those fins. He's a funny little fellow. He's going to be a skin diver when he grows up. Whoops, look at him go. He's well on his way already. They have good speed boats here too, and Perry has a hickory slap. When they put both together, you have this, water ski. That flop is Perry's own special fin. For those who are thirsty, the milk of the coconut offers a refreshing sweet drink. The milk is always cool, for nature has perfected a husk around the coconut that keeps it so. Now that's my idea of good living, just sitting around the pool and drinking coconut milk. It was while we were sitting here and talking to Bud Parr that we learned some of the history of Las Cruces and Baja California. He told us about the days when Cortez first came here, how Cortez sailed across from the mainland in 1533 and walked along this nearby beach he called it Playa del Oro, the Golden Strand, and he named California for two geographic features he found near here, the Bay of Arches, Cala y Fornax. When the first Spaniards landed here, they had a little difficulty with the Indians, and three of them were killed. This tile plaque depicts Cortez making peace with the Indians. The three crosses were erected to commemorate the massacre of the three Spanish sailors, hence the name Las Cruces. This is the coat of arms of Las Cruces, the crosses, the jumping marlin, pearls, and coconut palms. At first, the crosses were made of wood, but the Indians pushed them off the cliff. The present ones are built of stone. They stand high, overlooking the bay that Cortez called the Golden Sea. Saravlo Island is far there in the background, about 10 miles away. Colonel, what about those pearls you mentioned? Pearl diving was once important here. They found the valuable blue pearl. This hacienda was founded by the pearl diving king of La Paz. If you've never tasted a mango, you have a treat in store for you, Bob. Is that so? What do they taste like? Something like a peach. The color and the texture are about the same. They're acidulous. The flavor is hard to describe, but they're very delicious. Many unusual shells are found along the beach, like the murex, the tent cowries, tiger cowries. The beaches are not overrun with tourists. They're a shell collector's paradise. Zale had some fun with these little fiddler crabs until one of them nipped her on the foot. After that, she lost interest in them. We all wanted to try our luck at big game fishing while at Las Cruces. We wanted to tackle a marlin or a swordfish. We found out that the boats went out early in the morning. Early? How early is early? Oh, down there, it's a very reasonable hour, say, 8 o'clock. You see, the fish are just offshore. 
and the natives say that marlin never bite before 9 a.m. or after 3 p.m. And somehow this corresponds very closely to the boatman's working day. <laughs> the boats are brought ashore at night because the occasional sudden winds that spring up here during some seasons might damage them. Besides, it's simpler to gas and check them thoroughly on land and then launch them next day. They usually figure two fishermen to a boat. So one morning, we loaded our line fishing tackle. We set out for the big fellows. It's really delightful to sit there and watch the blue, blue water as you sail out from Las Cruces. The sea is calm. The sun is always shining. Our skipper was headed for Sarablo Island. He said the best fishing was over there. We used two boats because I wanted to take some pictures. The extra boat is for the cameraman. Do you always get stuck with a camera assignment, Colonel? Oh, not always, but then I enjoy it. It's lots of fun. You're up high where you can see what's going on. And this has an advantage. I could see Marlin following the boat. I yelled to our skipper, and he yelled across the other boat to put out the bait. The bait is flying fish. Marlin seemed to prefer them. We waited. I spotted a billfish following them. A billfish? Yeah, marlin, sailfish, swordfish, all are called billfish. When they slowed Zale's boat, sure enough, a marlin came up, struck the line. After the marlin struck, Zale allowed the line to run. At first, we were not sure he had taken the bait, only hit it with his bill. We yelled to Zale to set the hook, and she did, and away he went, leaping, slashing, greyhounding. A marlin really puts on a show. This one jumped 16 times in a row. You can count them. or a sailfish? It's difficult to tell when they first jump. Sometimes a sailfish spins his sail. This one was a big sailfish. You can see every now and again, he flares that sail. I imagine success in this fishing depends a lot on how the skipper maneuvers the boat. You're right, Bob. Half the trick of landing a big fish depends on him. And these skippers are marvelous. Is Zale still using that light tackle I saw her with a moment ago? Oh, yes, yeah, she's using very light tackle. It's a six-thread line with a breaking strain of 18 pounds. She had to play that fish for an hour and a half. And all during this time, that fish battled and jumped and slashed and walked on his tail. When we came up close to the fish, it made another run. The line sang out. Everybody yelled, but Zale hung on. <laughs> We wanted her to land that fish because she had never hooked a sailfish before. After a while, she wanted someone to give her a hand. But we told her she had to play the fish all by herself. You know, Colonel, this might sound silly, but just why does a hooked fish jump like that? When a fish is hooked lightly just inside his mouth on the hard, bony plate, like this one was, uh, he'll jump and fight on the surface to get rid of the hook. If he swallows the hook, the fish often sounds deep and he sulks. Sometimes he dies before he's landed. Now off Las Cruces, you can catch a dozen of these a day if you really wanted to, but no true sportsman ever boats more than one fish a day. We were welcoming this opportunity to get pictures of Zale playing this sailfish. And then we intended turning it loose so it could fight again some other day. I've got a hand at this, Zale. I think I'd have yelled uncle by now. Well, her hands get very tired from cranking. Before she released it, 
Perry decided he wanted underwater shots of that fish. So over he went with his underwater camera. Isn't that kind of risky? It is. With a hooked fish in the water and sharks in the neighborhood, we were somewhat anxious. But we watched Perry very closely. Incidentally, I think these are some of the first shots ever made of a sailfish underwater alive. In running and jumping, the fish got the line wrapped around his tail, taking a lot of the fight out of him. Perry tried to get him to act up a bit, but the fish had worn himself out. We were still worried about the sharks, and we called to Perry to hurry up and get back in the boat. If Perry accidentally touched that fish, that would disqualify Zale from any record, wouldn't it? It would if it was a record fish, but this one is not. There's a 15-foot steel trace at the head of the hook, and when that steel trace can be reached by the boatman, then it's legal to bring the fish aboard. When we had that fish alongside, we realized it was done. If we cut him loose, he probably would die. And this is a beautiful sailfish, the first one Zale has ever caught. It was a beautiful 120-pounder. would make a nice trophy over her mantle. Back at Las Cruces, she was photographed with her catch. But of all the trophies a young lady can catch at a playground by the sea, this is the one she decided to take home. Those stingrays, aren't they dangerous? Oh, they can be. The barb is in the tail. If you step on it, it can lash its tail and plant this right up to the hilt. You'll notice it has barbs on it like a jungle spear. It's bony and brittle. It'll break off in the wound. You have to push it on through. They aren't poisonous, but they are infectious. And I've known men to die from the poison that developed. A sting from a ray is horribly painful. You're scaring me, Colonel. I'll be afraid to go swimming at the beach from now on. Oh, you don't have to worry, Bob. The stingray is very rare along most of our inhabited beaches and accidents with them are almost unheard of in our surf. Rescue a drowning person may be the difference between life and death. She avoids the danger of a front approach by a surface dive. Zale is careful to keep the victim's nose and mouth clear of the water while she secures a cross chest carry and tows the victim ashore. If a diving approach is impossible and the panicked swimmer grabs your wrist, don't be frightened. Plant your foot against his shoulder, pull him diagonally across your body onto his back, then go into your carry. This seldom happens to a good swimmer, but it can, a front strangle hold. Knowing which arm to grab, a quick push up on the elbow while the wrist is pulled downward and twisted makes it easier to break this hold. A back strangle hold has no terror for Zale. A lift to the elbow, a tug on the wrist, and a twist of the arm, and presto, she is free. Well, Colonel, what's the nature of our next adventure? We're going underwater, but instead of scuba and skin diving, we're going by submarine, and it's entitled Torpedo. The incredible story of a United States submarine which slipped by the Japanese harbor defenses at Nagasaki and proceeded to blow up the place in full view of the astonished enemy. films of this daring exploit are classics of drama and valor. 
Well, I'm sure you won't want to miss this tremendous story. So on behalf of Colonel Craig, Zale Perry, and our sponsor, this is your host, Bob Stevenson, thanking you, ladies and gentlemen, and inviting you to be with us again, same time, same station, for Torpedo on the Kingdom of the Sea.